So we'll call our meeting to order. And we have a roll call, please. Mr. Ballard? Here. Mr. Demacchia? Ms. Johnson? Mr. Sturgill? Here. Mr. Williams? Here. Pledge of Allegiance? See, that's key. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This time we'll have our first recognition of visitors. Are there any special visitors that we have today? They're all special. All right. Then why don't we go ahead and move on to the hearing of the public. This is our first hearing of the public. There will be another one towards the end of the meeting, but if there's anyone from the public who would like to address the board, this is the one of the designated times to do so. Perhaps there will be some later. Moving on, uh, I need a motion um, to amend, approve, or approve the signed minutes from our previous meeting. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Ballard? Yes. Mr. Sturgill? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Any old business? I think there's one piece of old business slash new business. I know many of us have received correspondence regarding Southview. Yes. Um, so it's old business because we've been in this project for, what is it, 12, 14 years, and we're almost at the end of it. We have a few buildings left to demolish. All the construction, for the most part, has been done. And um, so I received um, an email that you guys received also, I think, from Angel Arroyo. Yeah. Um, with some, I guess, that, that, no, I don't guess, the real serious concerns. Um, Southview Building is, set up, is, is, is scheduled for demolition. Um, but right now, it is not being... Um, there's no security there. And so it's come to our understanding through community folks is there are lots of folks going in. They're posting stuff on social media. Um, so there's a high volume of occupancy in the building. It's not a safe place. There's live wires that may be hanging. And, um, and I'm sure there are folks in there. Um, there's some vandalism going on. Um, I understand that there's some artifacts and things that were probably of value, um, some trophies and things that were left, um, which is, you know, when we're looking at, at preservation of history, even if we're going to destroy things or not keep things, there's a way of doing that. And so there's some concern that um, this part of the process um, maybe lacks some um, boundaries. Um, I'm not sure, what is the date of, cons of, of actual demolition? I don't know the actual date yet. I know a lot of trees were taken down. Have they fenced in the area yet? Or is there any kind of security? At this stage, I think we need to, um, you know, through you, communicate with the administration, um, and Jeff Hawks and Dave Hardy and everyone, that there's, there's, we're getting concerned. I think the police have stated they don't have the manpower to post um, a, a, an officer there or even an auxiliary. Maybe it could get on the auxiliary schedule. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's certain prime times. Any other comments from anyone? You know, I've gotten some phone calls as well, so I took a ride over there. And it is fenced in at this point. But from what I understand, there's been three or four arrests daily of people going in and them catching vandals and like jumping the fence, or is there another jumping, way they're getting they're in? They're jumping the fence, and I'm not sure how they're getting in under. Yeah, so there, there's been arrests, and I guess there was at least six over the weekend. Where and, and then last night, I'm understanding it was three 12 year olds that were found in there, and the concern is that there's live wires hanging, uh, and. I guess council, city council has reached out to the administration and they're not getting a bit of a response. So they did bring it to our attention trying to help get a better response before someone gets injured there or, or killed there. So I don't know if you can expedite or at least talk to some other people on how to better secure that, even if we need to put security there ourselves, because the police, are, they're just reacting. Uh, but when they get in, the kids are already in, inside the gate. And that be, might be a cost, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure based on the the monies that we have in our in our fund um, for the building project specifically, mm -hmm. that will be an appropriate expenditure. I mean, I don't think that being brought to our level of attention at this stage, mm -hmm. um, where it's at between now and demolition, um, the number of arrests that have already occurred, the fact that we have minors, kids in there, um, the worst thing that happens is someone gets hurt, mm -hmm. and then there's the all the activity lawsuits pending that, but most importantly, the injury that's occurred. So um, our recommendation, one, would be that we get a report 
at our next meeting on what means or what actions have, have been put in place, and that um, and we'll make a motion when Mr. Demaki gets back that um, if it's the board doesn't have any decision making authority in this, but we would absolutely recommend um, expenditure of funds if necessary um, to make sure we protect the site, protect the community, and um, to whatever level of yeah. I'll definitely check into it and also make sure brings to mind the whole other aspect of it is the liability piece of oh, yeah. the liability insurance make sure <clears throat> everything's covered yeah. and somebody goes in there even if they're robbing it you could still be liable for them of course you will be liable. Yeah. maybe commit a crime it doesn't mean that you're off the hook mm -hmm. and, um, and then a lot of folks you know it's that nostalgia and of course it's their last visit mm -hmm. <laughs> unofficial <laughs> visit but um I'm sure there's things in there that they're going to sell off and uh, you From know, what I understand, decided not to. And auction off. From what I understand, they decided not to do the auction piece because there were. I know we had got, and I had forwarded some inquiries. Mm -hmm. People inquired about. Um, there's lots of stuff in there that, especially nonprofits, um, would be very interested in, um, either being it being given to them or being auctioned. Um, the the rules around this changed a few years ago in terms of what could be auctioned, what you can give away, what you can't give away, and so people don't understand that school districts are very restricted by state law on how they can distribute and disperse things of, yeah. of not used to them. Um, and you can no longer just give stuff away. It used to be a time that you call 10 nonprofits, say, hey, we got some tables, come look and take them. Now you have to post it, you have to bid it. So you have to go through and inventory everything. Mm -hmm. Usually there's a third party, an outside company that comes in and they go through the entire inventory. They charge you a fee and then they basically conduct your auction. And it goes online and people bid. And of course, whenever you start that, it has to be equal opportunity. The posting has to be for X amount of time. And it gets to be, I guess, a little bit challenging. We did it with, um, before we tore down Admiral King. Um, and I think it proved to be maybe a little bit more trouble. Then you got people who said they want to buy the stuff. They've been on an auction. They never show up to pick it up. So I think the, the, dis the, the, the administration decision was not to do that. So they've stated, is that accurate, that they're not doing that whole bid thing? I know there's not an auction as far as I know. I know they pulled a decent amount of things out, but I did know there was some stuff remaining. Um, when it comes to the bidding, you don't necessarily have to do an auction, but you do have to make it available um, for purchase. And if there's no interest, then, then you can make it available. There's, there's a set of different ways of doing it. And, but you can also do it online. So if you send out an email to other districts and things like that, you can as long as you're making them available. Is it? But it's done by the person who got the bid. Now they actually own the building, right? Isn't that the way it goes? At this person? point now, yes. Yeah, they actually. Once it goes into the construction. If you want anything out of there, you're dealing with yeah. whoever whoever took the bid. At, at this point, the building is the building. Anything in the building is the construction manager's property, basically. Yeah. So at this point, it's not even something we could go in and pull it out because. The majority of the time, they go in and look what's remaining, and then they assign a scrap value to a lot of the stuff remaining in the building. So you start kind of changing the contract between the district and whoever has that construction manager. Well, with that knowledge, perhaps maybe it might be their responsibility. To it, that's what I'm thinking. Twenty-four hour security yes. at the building. But we still own it. We still well, it's still our property. Yes. No matter how you slice it, we're we're in it, but they might be in it with us. They have to carry a certain amount of uh, liability insurance as well, and that's what I want to check on. I know Southview is still on our liability insurance, but I want to make sure. The construction project, the construction manager has the liability up to speed, and if they need security, I wonder how much of this has been relayed to them because with them not being on site daily, who knows if they're actually being made aware of it? Oh, that's he's, he's leading. It. He's the one that'll take you. He'll take you on a tour and show you where the vandalism is going on. Oh, the construction manager. So the walls are unstable at this point. So the construction oh, yeah. company is reaching out also. Yeah, absolutely, to the police and to. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't read into that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well. I'll look into it. Okay. Okay. Any other conversations on that old business? You, if you, if there's some questions that you have when we get to the secondary in the public, uh, you can redress those during that time. But we'll just wait until we get to that part. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Oh. We will be soon. Okay. Won't take long. <laughs> I'll report recommendations of the treasurer. Uh, the only thing I have is I do have the year-end reports. Um, I'm waiting for the final approval on them and everything. As soon as he signs off on them, I will send them over to you guys to look through it. Uh, the numbers did come exactly to what I showed you, so I think there was $16 million carryover, I think is the number I showed you. 16? So, 16, I think it was. This year, 16? I believe so. It's whatever number I showed you last. I don't have it with me. 
currently, but um, I know they're all we're closed up for the year and everything is ready to go. I just want to get them to sign off and then we'll shoot them out to everyone. So that was actually better than last year. It yeah. was, and I know we came in. I believe I projected a $10 million carryover, and I think we came in five, six million dollars better than my projection. What was our open enrollment number? Was that less than the projected? Because I know we've been projecting pretty conservatively on losing a lot, and then we started breaking even and zeroing out. Yeah, it's it's still right around that break even. So we're flat. Number. Yeah, it's still remaining somewhat flat. Okay, and then um, based on what we did, um, let's say we had a increase open enrollment next year. Mm -hmm. We lost 100 kids. Mm -hmm. That's about how much money is that? Five. Six hundred thousand. Yeah, about six hundred thousand. Okay, so, and I think we need to monitor that because with a lot of things that are happening, um, there's there's a lot of. I mean, um, I know folks in other districts, mm -hmm. and they're filling up to the brim and cutting it off. So I think that's a number. We always try and find those those things to watch that are indicators of what our budgeting is going to be. Yes. Um, besides the collection from the auditor mm -hmm. um, on on real estate, that enrollment number is huge. Oh, it's way bigger than the, uh, the collection from the auditors. Yeah. Pennies compared to yeah. the enroll open enrollment piece. And we lose 200, and that's 1.2 million. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's possibly the best carryover since about 2001. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's good. Um, following that, report we, recommendation. Did we ever get those test scores that we, that we requested last meeting? I asked about them, and Bill. Oli was looking into him. He he did receive the the raw data, mm -hmm. and um, I meant to touch base with him again. But I did check. He does have the raw data, and I don't know about the interpreting piece. of I know you wanted somebody to come in and kind of give that interpretation. Yeah, of we it. can do that. If, if we, we just get the raw data, I mean, they've had it for yeah. about six eight weeks. Six okay. weeks. I, don't know. I mean, it's it's always great when when Oli does it because you get a lot of historical context. Exactly. Um, you can ask questions um, that. Are more specific to us and our history, um, and if we have to have an outside person come in, I mean we've read these things enough times, but it's just having a professional educator mm -hmm. credibility. Um, but they don't have the historical context. So our preference is that our administration present this data to us um, as we've done in the past, okay. and um, before we go to outside. But if they if they don't have the time or the interest or whatever, then we'll just contract from like maybe the ESC seems like it's the most local. So the, the next board meeting you you will present, present your wrap your year and wrap up too? Um, I'll bring you out, I'll bring you all the like the SM2 and talk through the different numbers with you and show you my projections versus where we finished up and we can look at previous year versus or compared to this year just to have an idea. And then we'll also have a based on the changes that we've had in terms of personnel wise and everything, mm -hmm. we have a projection of what next, the following year looks like. Because mm -hmm. I know some of the things we have these, um, and then hopefully the, over the next couple of years, this will cancel that out. You know, we don't have this fee, we don't have this thing, we don't have that thing. So it kind of balances, but then the reality of it sets in and those things go away. You know, no longer do we have what we saved on um, St. Mary's. Yes. No longer do we have what we saved because of the savings. The savings are only for one year. Yeah, retirement savings are one year. I saw there were, in that one thing, I saw there were a lot of retirements. We've had quite a few. And of course, those are those top end salaries, mm -hmm. and they balance the budget nicely. They do, but then they go away. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. So I think that'll be important for that context. Um, any other? Anything else on that? Mm, nope. Uh, item nine: report and recommendations on CEO personnel matters. Nothing there. Okay. Um, nothing on ten. R11. Mm -hmm. Any new business for discussion, gentlemen? We've already kind of gotten the request from board members on 13. This time we'll have our second hearing of the public, so if there's anyone from the community that would like to address the board, this would be the appropriate time. Yes, sir. And again, the instructions would be for some of us to do. Um, go to the podium there. There should be a log where you can write your name and address. Please state your name and address, and then um, whatever your concern is. Generally, we don't really answer questions because some questions we don't have answers to. And if you answer one question, but you don't know the answer to another one, the person feels like they didn't get their answer. Um, oftentimes, the answer isn't among us. It's an administrative answer, so we have to defer that. 
um, but always um, if there's um, the questions are taken and then I think our general protocol is someone will get back to you with with an answer as long as they have your information typically we um, there's like a three minute piece but we kind of just indulge folks um, so feel free to address us George Sandiford I just wondered if anybody on the board thought about donating that stuff at the school to Habitat for Humanity. Okay, we can, um, we can have that question to the administration. I think what we discussed previously is there are certain guidelines and rules set by Ohio Revised Code State Law in terms of how school districts can dispense with things. And I think blanket donations are not allowable. Not in the initial thing. You have to you have to make them available for other districts, non-publics, things like that, for sale. And then if there's no interest sale-wise, then I think they can become a donation to uh, districts, non-publics. And if at that point, then if nobody takes them, I think at that point, then you can start exploring other donations. And also, at this stage, usually that occurs between the construction company taking ownership mm -hmm. and the district ownership. Right now, because of the phase that it is in, in the demolition, is we technically don't own anything in that structure anymore. That is now the property mm -hmm. of the demolition slash construction company. So um, again, that can be addressed more current with the um, director of operations who would know specifically about the law around that. But at this stage, I think one is out of our hands. Two, the district made some decision some time ago in terms of how are they going to execute that, and they by default decided not to. Because we had, I had a lot of calls. There were a lot of folks, because there's a lot of stuff in that building. Uh, so. Well, I just thought because it's such a large, well-respected organization that they might have a little clout with the people that have the say-so on who gets what and how and when and whatever. And there's, there are lots of those there. I think by law, you have to offer to other school districts, to charter schools. There's a whole series of protocols um, and quite frankly, sometimes rather than going through all those hoops, an administration will simply choose to, let's just, uh, yeah. And it's, it's terrible because you see this waste thing, but it's, yeah. Uh, just a thought. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Marge Walker. I just have a comment here to make is uh, I like to thank the Boys and Girls Club because they seem to do an awful lot to help with the education system, the Lorraine Public Library system, and the LCC. It seems like that they really do a great job in helping in further the education and the foundation for what accomplishments we have already had. And that's it. This time we would announce our. Oh, oh come on, Gene. E. G. Rice, 1034 MLK Boulevard, 21st Street. As a citizen, a taxpaying citizen, as well as president of uh, NAACP, I hate to bring it up about the levy. Is it old business? Is it new business? Or what is it? I really have a concern. And you know what? I am tired. I've been coming out here debating with you guys for a year now. We're still in the same hole. Would somebody please answer that for me, please? Because you know what's going to happen? Are you thinking down the road? We don't pass that. You know what's going to happen. The state can take it, every one of these buildings and turn them to charter schools. And that's what we're screaming that we don't want to have. So what is the problem? Don't forget, school board members, the citizens of Lorraine is your boss. You're not our boss. We're y'all's boss. And I always, when I ever accepted a job, and my boss told me what to do and I didn't do it, guess what happened to me? <laughs> what happened if you don't do what your boss said? You get fired. You get fired. We hit you in the pocket, we cut the funds off. So we need to get serious about 
what you're supposed to be doing. Thank you. Julie Garcia, 4612 Andover Avenue, Lorraine, Ohio. Taxpaying citizen, business owner, homeowner, and staff member. With regards to the levy, when Mr. Hill announced a $16 million carryover as a taxpaying citizen, a supporter of every single levy that I have ever been able to vote on, I'm going to have a real hard time supporting another renewal levy when you have $16 million carryover. So asking for a levy when you have $16 million carryover is going to be really hard to pass with this community considering what's happening with the CEO. When you hire 53 new administrators, you're going to have a real hard time passing that levy. When I, as a master's plus 30, 29-year member of this staff, am unassigned, I'm going to be a building sub, a very highly paid building sub. Community members are going to have a real hard time passing a new levy or even a renewal. Thank you. Anyone else? I just have a quick, when the renewal, that means yes, no money is being added, yes, right. right? Nothing being added, it's just the renewal. Renew, just the renewal. Yeah, so what happens in a renewal is, they, and we use the term, and we're very in, in explicit about no new taxes. Right. It's not the elimination of an old tax. Okay. Um, there are other scenarios that we've considered in the past that we'll consider again in the future um, of looking at, at levies that aren't always based on a property tax. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, that's what districts have done. Um, especially in our community when we have such a large number of seniors who are paying that property tax mm -hmm. and we have lots of folks who are in rental situations who don't necessarily pay that directly. Mm -hmm. So there's always been the discussion of um, what are our options in terms of taxing mm -hmm. um, and um, you know so we've had lots of discussions about that. We've went back and forth with the city because there are certain funds that traditionally the city goes after mm -hmm. and the ones the board goes after. There's always been you stay in your watering hole, we'll stay in our watering hole mm -hmm. um, but as times have gotten tougher um, cities have moved into other places. Um, so primarily for districts, our tax base is real estate, property taxes. And so again, um, when it's no new tax, it doesn't mean you have less on your property tax. It just means there's not that addition. And we know in our district that not only do we need renewals, we will need new money. Because what new money means is you're operating currently. For example, we spent about 20 years um, operating on 1980 money. Yeah. And so... Um, yeah, there's always that challenge, but again, I think when communities have to pass initiatives, even um, with what Ms. Garcia brought up regarding the surplus, really identifying what a surplus is. A surplus in our business isn't the same as a surplus in other businesses. Um, so those, we do this five-year forecast, and she understands certain pieces, but again, the, where she's absolutely correct is the optics of it, the perspective of it. When you present that you're flush then that's, that creates, so we have to be really careful with the messaging. Um, that's why we've been very careful in how we, you know, this renewal levy, we have three opportunities to do it, and um, we're very protective of that. And in this current environment, putting it out there um, would be perhaps considered by many disastrous because of the, this, how steep the uphill piece would be. So we have, we're gonna have lots of discussions. It is old business, it's new business, it's current business, it's future business, it's never, it's never not part of our discussion and how we address the finances of the district. So um, there's no one else at this time. Um, we can announce our next meeting. Josh. Oh, oh yes, ma'am. Please. Did we answer your question, though? Do we? Mine? Yes, ma'am. Well, I didn't. Were you clear? Well, I was, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know, but the, <laughs> I was, because, and Take I look. Take her off of her, please. You don't want to be on the camera. Right. <laughs> can't hear her. Okay. 2017, that in May, you discussed the levy was on the, 
on your agenda, and he said with the man, the county auditor, so I thought we were all clear. So what changed between then and now? I mean, it was discussed, it was ready to go, and he gave the date, three days, you could come in, the three times it could come up, it was discussed then, in November. So yeah. it's taken all of this time to discuss to see no, what, what, I don't. See, what, 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 what the treasurer did is he informs us on uh -huh. the dates, the timelines. Right. All these things fit in the timeline. And so what happens is at a certain stage, X number of months before something happens, mm -hmm. okay, guys, if we're going to end up doing this, here's, here's all the details around it. Uh -huh. here, are, here are the cost factors. Here's where we're at. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to do this, it, it's got to be triggered by a certain date. So if you do A on this date, then you can do B on the next date. And all of this is leading up to a final date. Uh -huh. And the other piece is the amount of time it takes to get the reports back and the approvals back. So we always know these timelines. Um, and we are aware of these timelines. Um, after this, we, will now, we, we now actually are gonna be into the next series of timelines for the second opportunity to do it. And those are all triggered. We know exactly for the, for the collection year of 2019, um, based on it being in the fall or the spring, exactly what these trigger dates are. Uh -huh. We know what they are for 2020. These are all prescribed, but the treasurer, um, in terms of his due diligence, makes sure the board is clearly informed on these timelines, which drive all the action. And that also then informs our levy committee and everybody else on what we need to do, um, you know, how much money we need to generate, um, what are the actions. So those are just what he does is gives us those timelines. Oh, okay. um, there was never a decision made yes or no. Um, and there's never a decision made until that decision is made. But there's lots of discussion around it. Yeah. Um, but most importantly is having that discussion in the context of the timeline. If we have discussion too late, you know, so um, okay. is that accurate? Yeah, the piece about the auditor, it was my, I always know the rough estimates of, okay, if it's going on in November, it's that first week of August that we have to have both resolutions approved in order to get it on the, the ballot. So what I do then is just to confirm the dates because I want absolutes. I, I don't want to put it out there. Oh, it's the first week of August. I want to say, you know, we have to have it approved by August 4th. So that's what I, when I uh, brought it up in the meeting, November. I said, yeah, for, no, for the November election that we have to have the two resolutions and it was confirmed through the auditor's office of these dates, the deadlines basically. I just confirmed the deadlines through okay. the auditor's office. Okay, so the first one that you said that uh, November, May, 2018 would be the first time we could put it on, right? This is what it says right here. Yes, November was the first time we can put it on. We have May. all of next calendar year. May. This is in November 2017 when you said the first chance we could put it on was May 2018. No. It says, Mr. Hill provide info from the auditor's office. May 2018 is the first opportunity to put on the ballot and three concurrent uh, levies coming due November 2020, both are considered renewals. It's probably, that's probably when we discussed it was May, and it was November, it's November of 2018, it's the first time it can go on. It can go on a total of three times, and we do still have all of next calendar year, so all of 19. Okay, I'm just totally, this confused me. What might be easier? Yeah, I can yeah. We'll talk if, later. We'll yeah, talk exactly. after. Yeah. I'll Josh, take a look at what that yeah. one on yeah. one. Yeah. We'll talk later. Yeah, yeah. It, it's probably because because sometimes the way the, the minutes read, sometimes it'll say the date of the meeting that you're talking about, and yeah, so November, maybe that's what it is. No, November 2000, 27, 2017. It says November 2017. Yeah. Oh, I, I wonder if that's a typo. Line. I got it. I took it off. Line. We'll take a peek at it. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Linda Lee, uh, I just have a question. I feel that it's important for you guys to put the renewal levy on the ballot. Well, I would like to know, from your standpoint, if the le if you do not put the levy on the ballot, what does that mean for the future of our schools and our teachers and the other services that's provided? In other words, if the levy, if there's no renewal of it, levy passed, what happens? Do you lay off teachers? <clears throat> so if we, is it okay for us to comment? You guys want to? Sure. Um, so my perspective, um, and what we've kind of discussed, we know some of the parameters, is ultimately if we don't pass a renewal levy, um, that will result in financial consequences. Um, there will be a reduction of something, um, usually some plural things. So there will be a reduction in force. 
there could be there would be probably could be a reduction in programs, reduction in services. Um, the what happens is when the money for, we passed a new money levy a few years ago. We needed six mil. We passed it for three point one mil. We passed it, but still had to make reductions. Our reductions were less because we asked for what we could get as opposed to what we needed. So anytime there is less revenue than you need, you have to make adjustments. And those adjustments don't usually just target one area. Um, the administration will try and spread those, um, those adjustments and those reductions so that they have the least, the least impact on student learning. Um, so that is a consequence. Um, there are lots of consequences. Um, and we know we have a certain amount of time in which we can avoid those absolute consequences. Um, the first opportunity um, for renewal, but we have three. And so what we're looking to do is we're saying this, there are some significant um, issues in our district um, that we, that the community needs resolution on and needs to um, be able to, um, to process in a certain way. And so what happens is, um, just like a community, communities, this is what they do. They have, they have their, that money piece. And what they say is to get these changes, um, to force people to have these discussions, um, there's a lot at stake. So we're very well aware, critically, um, of the risk of not, of in the, over the next three years, of not repassing that renewal. Um, there are times in the past that we've made decisions on renewals or new money, on when is the opportune time to put it on the ballot. Sometimes we avoid um, the general election because of all the noise, and we go under the radar. Other times we go for the general election because there's more people who we believe coming out to support our initiatives. There's always strategies around what the levy campaign does and when they do it. Bambi could speak to that more clearly. Um, but there's also how we assess um, the position of the district in the community. And it's not just that we put it out there. We have to pass it when it's out there. So we are very protective of the levy. We value the levy um, as high, if not higher, than most folks because we're clearly aware of the challenges. When Bill and I came on, um, we had a $4 million deficit. Then the next year was a $12 million deficit. We, we know. We handled a 21, I think it was 21.4 in two years. Two years. So we're, we're, listen, we've dealt with deficits. We're used to it. We're used to having, we had what we, we had a riff of, I don't know, it was ridiculous. Um, reductions in cheerleading, reductions in sports at junior high. So as a district, um, for the last 20 years, or 16 years anyway, uh, before we got on the board, there was a 300 person riff. I mean, we've been dealing with fiscal issues in our community ongoingly, even when we have money. When we, when we were getting money, we didn't have enough money. So we've always dealt with this. Um, right now, we have a projection in 20, 22 or 2025 of a 20 million we can look at we've always our five-year forecast this is the first time um, in recent years over the last two years three years that we've had a five a five-year forecast that wasn't red but we knew it was going to turn red again mm -hmm. why is it going to turn red again because if you don't get new money which you don't put in the forecast it turns red so we go from 15 years of looking at red to the last three years of looking at black and it's turning red again um, again, so we know the need to pass, not only to pass the, the renewal, but at a certain stage, we have to be in a position with the community to get new money. We can't just pass renewals. We have to get renewals, and, but we also have a certain amount of time. We know we have three years to do it. And I think what we need to be able to say to the community is when we put it out there, that we have the confidence um, that the expectations of a community are being met in terms of the stewardship and in terms of um, the information that's shared. So that's where we are. We're, listen, we're not, we're not naive. Um, we're not um, in the dark. Um, we've, we've talked about this. I think presently the $3.1 million is probably about 51 teachers if it were just in teachers. That's very challenging. We know, the, we know the real, because we've had to do this before. So we don't take it lightly. We don't take it like it's just one, a big, you know. No, we take it very seriously. And, and I hope you can appreciate that we have as much, if not more, concern about this than you do. And so sometimes when it's characterized that we aren't thinking about this or thinking about that, you can say what I do, but you can't say how I feel or what I think. And what happens is that's what people do. They stand there and they say, well, you guys must think, you You can say what we do, but quite frankly, um, that's about all. And so, but to assume that we don't have concern or that we aren't intelligently understanding of what's happening, what I'm sharing with you is we do know the consequences. We do know the ramifications. We also know what this levy means in terms of the one card we've got to play, and we're going to play that card to get the kind of cooperation 
in a district that we think is reasonable for a community to have. Is, so that, is that accurate, gentlemen? So you're saying that in the future, you may put the levy on. Is that what you're saying? What we're saying is we have every expectation. We, we have a window right now between the next time that we, this can go on to get a considerable change in our behavior, to get a considerable change in the, how, how the communication goes in the district. We expect to put a levy on when it's the right time. Right now, it is not the right time. Right now, these are not the kind of interactions and communications and relationships that are in a healthy district. So that's, we're, we're not, listen, we, we know that we got three chances to do it. And what gets scarier is that every window, it gets smaller. And that's, yeah. So if, if you, excuse me, if you put the levy on in, in November and it didn't pass, then you have until May to put it on again. Is that we're not, correct? We, is that, is yeah, that we're not putting it I think That is correct. That is correct. Okay, but. You're saying, you're telling me about the reduction in services. It could happen. That could happen. Yeah, and that won't happen for, that's not going to happen. Because we don't do this, there's going to be no change next year. This money is not next year's money. Right. Right. So we know that we have a window to have the conditions, if you want to call it that, what we consider are advantageous to the levy and to the district. And so um, there's a lot of pressure. There was an enormous amount of pressure. Um, and thinking of what could happen because anytime you have three chances, you want to take all three. But again, there have been times in the past that we chose to opt out of the first chance because of whatever environmental conditions existed, and that's where we are now. We're we're not um, we're not naive. We haven't considered the ramifications. We have not not considered the consequences. Um, so this is not like we're blind. Um, it's some, well, yeah. the communication kind of gives you the feeling that I know you said you're you guys care about it, but. Mm -hmm. All of the communication and the things that we've been reading in the paper, it just seemed very negative that you, you I don't want to say you don't care. That's, but that's, again, that's your, that's your but interpretation. Because we not, from, not only me, yeah. other people. There, the there, there are lots of folks who feel like you feel. Yeah, because people and there, I talk wait, to feel that way. And there are they a whole lot of folks. And there are a whole lot of folks who feel different ways. This is what we always say this. There is never. But, we never know what the people say because there's this group of people, there's that group of people, um, and we've had folks stand in your spot and say renewal out of the question based on A, B, C, and D. We've had other folks say we need to do this. Listen, we hear from everyone. Okay. And, and to assume that we're ignoring anyone, again, we, we don't hear from one sector of folks. We hear from a variety of people. And um, so, yeah. Any other well, comments, it, please, because I don't want to be the... It just seems to me that the com community, I mean, you're hearing from one sector, I'm hearing from another sector. But it's up to the community to say yay or nay if it's put before... Well, yes and no. It's, what, what first happened is it's up to the board, based on the vote of the community, to make the decision on what and when. That's not, that's not changed. The, the board is elected by the community. They're elected to make decisions. Right? And then the board, then at its discretion, based on its information and its assessments, says yes, now. Or it says not now, then. It, it always says this. It says how much? Um, like I said before, we needed 6.1. We asked for 3.1. There are many folks in the community and on the board who thought we should have asked for more money. What happened in the past is the more money you asked for, the less chance it was of passing. So you get to a point where you say, we need this, but let's try and get this and step out of it. Listen, we know the need. We've spent a lot of time working on levy committees, being engaged with the community. This is not new to us. There are some folks, quite frankly, who we've never seen before. And we've been doing this, he and I, for eight plus years. And there are folks who always participate. We, have new, and we always welcome new participants. Come on in, new participants. But this isn't new to us. And so we're not, um, yes, we have lots of anxiety. I think we have lots of concern and consideration, but um, we're clear. We're not. Um, yeah, you guys are clear. Yeah, well, we're others, clear. Others are not, but you guys don't seem to be very clear. That's true. I, I would just add um, the first time I'm hearing about a $16 million carryover mm -hmm. is today for me. It's my first time ever hearing that. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no way as a fiduciary or a fiscal responsible person that for the elected on this board that I should hear about that for the first time when everybody else hear about it. And that's the kind of communication that we've been talking about all along that we need from us making the decision that we make and from the administration making the decision that they make. We need to be able to do those decisions together 
So then even if we wanted to do a, re, a, a levy, a renewal, there's going to be a lot of people who say, you guys got $16 million extra that but you didn't need. Where does that go? For? I understand, but, but hear, you, hear the sound bite. In the sound bite in the community, they got $16 million that sitting there that they don't even need. Why are we going to give them more money? That's, that's how that plays to a certain community. It really does. Trust me. But, and for but every renewal person, is no new money, so I, I don't but, know what you're saying. But if, if your dues is $100 a, a, a month, and we say we want to renew this again at $100 a month, or you don't have to pay any dollars a month, it's still a change in people's cash flow at home. Yeah, what happens if it it's still a change in their cash flow? It's not like it's not like there's no money going out. It's still just that same hundred dollars. Right. A lot of people in Lorraine would like to have that hundred dollars in their own pocket because they need it. All we're saying, and I say the school needs as much money as they can get. All we're saying, so we don't get caught up in the personalities of this. In our role, there's a certain level of communication that has to take place when you talk about the business of the district. And for some reason, we refuse to get that cooperation coming from the administration who refused to talk to us. Okay, so why did the six? Why, why is this the first time you heard about the sixteen million? Because Carry over. Did you? How did it come up about today? Did you guys ask the question today? If not less. We should always have that information if it's available to a board. We shouldn't have to ask. That's really available to us. I brought up. I brought up preliminaries because we weren't. Give me one second. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. So who else are you blaming then? I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not blaming anyone, ma'am. My only oh, statement was. should have been the one to tell you. <laughs> my only statement to you, I'm, I'm sorry, to Mrs. Lee, <laughs> yes. is this should not be the first time I hear about well, those. Well, then talk to your treasurer about not telling you until today. What about last week? You got the answer. You don't want to hear what I'm saying. So if you got the answer, it's just talk. That's what we're here to do, talk, man. We're here to talk in the public. The yeah, problem and, is, and is we're, we're not, not here to banter. Yeah. 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 Folks. Yeah. yeah, we're not here to banter with you. Hey, Bambi. Hi. You got to remember your address, huh? Yes, I know. I, I can't read, print your last name, yes. then your first name. Can I answer? Please. Yes. Okay, I just have a couple things. First, like, there are different parts of the community that does feel differently. And I am approached by both sides. Some are in favor and some are not. The ones that are not want to wait. They, they said they wouldn't. Normally, they would vote for any school levy. They would not vote for a school levy in November. They would like to see the process that's being put in place, see how it goes. Because they see that they can count how many new administrators were hired, and they can read. Because I did finally figure out how to go online to get Mr. Hardy's stuff, and I can read how much money they're all getting, and that's not including their benefits. That's just base salary, right? That's on there. Yes. Okay. So when they see that, they don't want to vote for a levy. They want to see now how this program is going to go into place and how it will affect. So that's why I'm not really that worried like as uh, these ladies are, because I've been doing this for how many years now? Like since the first bond issue, so it's been what, 16 or 17 years? And I think that the citizens of Lorraine always support the schools. And if the administration can prove to them that this system is going to work, I can't see how they would not vote for it next year. Then the second thing, as a citizen of Lorraine, I would like to see the school board, the distress committee, and Mr. Hardy get together as a group of adults and get this straightened out. Because I, I can't see why this is like this. It really bothers me that there's no communication among all three of you. I was shocked to see that your school board meeting was the same day, same time as the distress committee. Now, how would they expect anybody to be in two places at one time? I think that's totally ridiculous. Because I myself would like to go to those distress committees, but I have my loyalty here to the school board. And then second of all, I know you guys probably don't want to hear this, but I feel strongly about it. 
if the levy was that important to Mr. Hardy, instead of sending a letter, he should have came here and voiced his opinion to them saying this means a lot to the district. So I think that you guys as school board members and Mr. Hardy as a CEO and the Tony Richardson, his distress committee, you guys all have to get on the same page. And I wish I could put you in a room with a refrigerator and a porta john and lock the door and not open it until you guys can decide and get everything together. I will second that. I'll start it, honey. Yeah, I think uh, Josh would like to um, offer some response regarding the uh... yes um, a, a few different things um, I did give a preliminary last meeting and I, I think I addressed Bill yes. yes after the fact but I also talked to Tony about it about what I was thinking because we, we weren't officially closed at that point yet mm -hmm. so and I, that was the projection um, and still we are the number the, the books are closed but the financial reports aren't officially approved yet but I wanted to bring it to you guys to say this is the number that I am taking down for approval. Basically, it's going to be roughly a $16 million carrier, which is about where I projected. Now, I know that seems like a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, but even with that, that's not far off from what I was projecting to finish out this year anyways. Mm -hmm. And with there's always increased costs, increased standards through the state, things like that. Um, as well as, you know, we had union contracts that are factored into increases. I mean, there's always things like that. So $16 million seems like a lot. It's not. It's not a lot when you're talking about a $120 million budget. Right. So, and, and I think that's, you got to look in perspective of the $16 million because when you look at it, I was factoring roughly, I think like a, <coughs> the end of this year, roughly about a 12 or $13 million dollar carry over and even with that considered when I'm doing my forecast we are still projecting in the end of 2021 a negative ending balance so that's you got to remember as we start to have see increases they compound so what is two million one year is four million the next year is eight million so those those uh, the deficit piece of that increases exponentially from year to year so to say we have a $16 million carryover, that's great, but you know that that doesn't nearly, when you're looking at the grand scheme of things with a $120 million general fund budget, it's, it it goes fast. And all it takes is, like we discussed earlier, 100 kids, 200 kids that might open and roll, and we see major swings in kids coming and going all the time. That's That could be gone in the drop of a hat. I estimate uh, roughly $5 million a year just to account for charter school loss, open enrollment elsewhere, things like that, just to be on the safe side for the forecast. So that's, it seems like a large number, 16 million, but it's really not in the grand scheme of things. So. Thank you. Any other questions, any other discussion? Thank you for your comments and your input. Um, at this time, our next meeting is scheduled for regular meeting. August 6th. So August 6th at 5 p.m. right here. May have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Sir. Discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Ballard? Yes. Mr. Sturgill? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. This has been a production of Lorraine City Schools TV20 WLCS.